The following interview was conducted with Betty Sudarth, the Registrar Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on <clears throat> Monday, February the 25th, 2008, and Stewart Center B26. Zienver is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Thank Tell you. us a little bit about where you were born and family and siblings and early years. Okay. I come from Kokomo, Indiana, so I didn't get very far down the highway. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have a brother a year and a half older and a sister five years older. So I was the youngest one. Okay. And your, were your parents from uh, Indiana? Uh, well, my mother was born in Chicago, okay. uh, but they moved to Kokomo. Her parents had a grocery store in Kokomo, and my dad uh, grew up on a farm outside okay. of Kokomo. Okay. So he worked at the Continental Steel Mill which is now out of business, but was one of the big factories there. Oh, right. Well, tell us about early years and about high school uh, organization and your athletics, and where'd you go to high school? I went to high, high school in what was then Kokomo High School, and now they've, as, as everybody has, they've totally changed that. Uh, I think it's maybe a junior high now where I went to high school, but... Um, was it a four-year? It was four years, and uh, there were about 350 or so in my class, my graduating class. What so, prompted you? Then you did you come to Purdue? Then what? Did yes, you I did. Uh, I was uh, I was very interested in chemistry, and I ended up coming over here and majoring in chemistry to start with. I couldn't get in the in the September class because it was right after World War II and all the uh, GIs were back with the GI Bill. So there was no housing. And at that time, freshman women had to live in the dorms. So What I, year was this when you entered uh, 1947. Okay. So the, I had to wait until January to come because then, then I could get in a, in a dorm. Sure, Where, what dorm were you in? I was in what we called uh, North Hall at the time. I think it's got a different name now. And then I was in Wood Hall for a while. And then I was in temporary barracks, uh, which were brought in to house folks. There was a barracks uh, from uh, Grissom Air Force Base, which was at that time Bunker Hill, so it was called Bunker Hill. Right. And there were also um, small units that were called Chippewa, and I lived in both of those over the time I was here. Okay. Well, what was your, uh, tell us a little bit about the, the campus during that time and your student organizations and okay. campus life. Okay. Yeah, the campus was really exciting because uh, there were, they had gone from like 4,000 before the war to 14,000. So you can imagine the kind of uproar that was going on. There was building going on all over the place. And there were also all kinds of temporary buildings around. So we had uh, temporary housing, but we also had temporary Quonset huts over there where the engineering, uh, some of the Those engineering were built buildings around that are time. now. And then the temporary buildings that they just took down uh, to build the uh, Neil Armstrong sure. building that was, I had chemistry classes in those, oh my. Uh, which is what they housed at that time. Sure. And uh, I can remember in the Quonset huts that uh, they had these blowers in the back of the of the Quonset hut, and they made so much noise that you had to turn them off so you could hear the instructor, and then you got cold, so you're sitting there with <laughs> hot and coat cold, on right? and your mittens, you know, trying to take notes. So, right. But it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. There was a lot of activity and a lot of things going on. Were there a lot of uh, uh, women at that time or not? No, there weren't. Uh, the semester that I came in, there were like 1,100 men and they said 97 women came wow. in. That was when they had the 10 to 1 ratio for that particular class, sure. but it was not quite that yeah. bad. But uh, it, th there weren't very many women, and there were very few women in science, and in, and I don't, not many at all in engineering. So, was there major? Would, did you major in chemistry then? I or? majored in chemistry, okay. yes. And then I went into math as well, so. I really kind of concentrated in math by the time I was finished. Right. What was the village like at that time when you were here? Was there much? Well, there was a drugstore and a post office, and uh, the bookstores were still there. Deeks was there, where Vons is now, um, Southworth's, um, and University Bookstore. There was a, they called him Pop, I don't know what his last name was, but he had a popcorn, little popcorn stand uh, right where University Bookstore is now. <laughs> and there were some restaurants. 
quite oh. a few restaurants, as That's a matter of fact. That's interesting. It's yeah. quite an interesting place. Sure. There were a lot of lots of activity going on there. Yeah. Were, there was even a dress shop. I remember there used to be Elsa Lynn was there one yes, time, you know. Yes, that's right. And uh, but that that was kind of handy then. Yeah. Well, when when did then, uh, when did you um, graduate? What year? Graduated in 1951. Okay. And uh, then what I, was your career path after that? Before well, the university? Uh, it was kind of interesting because I, as I said, I was a chemistry major, but I was being told by a lot of the professors that no one would hire me because I it was a woman, and they didn't want to have women in their labs and so forth, which turned out not to be true, but they convinced me, so I sort of switched over into the math area, and um, I was interviewing places and, and really was offered a number of jobs, and Helen Schliemann called me up one day and said... What sort of jobs were you in? Uh, was this an in industry or... Yes, okay. well, drug companies. Okay. And industry, both. Sure. Um, and Helen Schliemann called me up and said that they had a, a uh, graduate assistantship in the what was then the st statistical laboratory, which was part of the math department, and she thought I should go over and talk to them. So I did that, and it was a they were willing to put two graduate program assistants together, make a full time job, full time position, but I could still go to school. So that, so seemed, to go to grad that seemed like a good idea. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> so that's what I ended up doing. So I didn't leave. I just, uh, in fact, I started to work right after right. Uh, okay. commencement. Then you, and then uh, a couple of things before the then you were a research associate in the Registrar of Admissions Office after that, weren't you? What was yes. the uh, statistical lab? Was it just affiliated with math, or what exactly was well, your duties? Well, it was uh, it was part it was a division of the math department, but it also was the beginnings of the computing center. Uh, it was they didn't have computers then; it was really uh, unit record equipment, IBM equipment. Sure. But that's the mainframe. The mainframe. Main that's where people brought their cards and and had their work done. Uh, so it was a fairly good sized operation. They all, we also had some uh, Air Force projects uh, that they were under contract and they were doing a lot of statistical mm -hmm. work. So you with served that. the university. The lab would serve if people wanted to stat work done and they could come send yes. their cards and things there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, actually. They were uh, housed in the what was the biology annex. That was the main office, okay. but then they had outgrown that, so they were housed over in these Chippewa units, which were over by the residence halls, over where the Corec gym is now. And they, when I went to work, they said, "Okay, we want you to go over to Chippewa Eight. Do you know where that is?" And I, that's where I had lived <laughs> one, one year. I lived in the same building, as a matter my, of fact. So. My goodness, it had changed since then. <laughs> yes. Oh, they were in terrible condition. Uh, you know, they really needed to be torn down. And when they did tear them down, they just put a chain around them and pulled them Dragged over. Dragged them yeah, away. Yeah, exactly. Right. Down the road, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. Then uh, now you were a counselor over in Hissey, and you also did some teaching in the School of Education. 68, yes, I uh, did. Uh, I ended up getting a PhD in uh, student services here at, at Purdue. At, at Purdue, uh -huh. yes, and uh, so I was an assistant professor in, in education for a little while. Okay. Yeah. What did you? What were you doing? You were doing some counseling work too over in the humanities. Yes, school, which now I was Hissey. doing uh, academic advising uh, in. Um, Hissy and I was uh, also doing research for the dean, okay. Dean Ogle, at the time. So while you were you uh, in grad school, you decided to go on for the PhD. Is that what? Yes. Oh, yeah. After you got your your grad your master's in, what, did you yes. get your master's in math or? Uh, no, I got it in counseling also. Okay. So yeah. And then went on for the PhD. Right. In the meantime, had a, raised a family. Okay. <laughs> got them off to school. <laughs> <laughs> One thing and another, yeah, right? Okay. Right. Now, then, when did you move into the registrar, and then you, you succeeded uh, Nelson, Nelson Parker? Parkers. Right, okay. Yes. Well, this is kind of interesting, uh, Catherine, because I uh, got into uh, the activity in the registrar's office actually as a result of having worked in the stat lab. Uh, Mr. Parkhurst was asked to do a statewide enrollment projection study in the 50s. And he wanted a statistician to help, and he had called over there. And at the time, I was not working there. 
but I had been working there, and the head of the department called me and said, you know, why don't you go over and, and talk to him? So I ended up helping with the very first statewide enrollment uh, projection that was made. Uh, so that was my first contact with the registrar's office. And then he asked me to do a couple more things. Right. So when he had a position available in the 72, I believe it was, 1972, he called and said, why don't you come over and work for us? We need you, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I did. Okay. I went over there. And I was uh, basically responsible for setting up the research for actually all of student services. and. Uh, working with the uh, Administrative Data Processing Center to work on uh, the various computer systems. That was my first position. and then When you when, first went over there? When I first went over there. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And then when uh, Mr. Parkhurst retired, I was uh, made the registrar. Tell us about those enrollment uh, reports. These were statewide projections? Yes. And is yes. that what they were doing? Or? That, yes. And that was with, uh, it was called the Indiana Conference for Higher Education, and it was a consortium of all the presidents, both the um, public schools and the private schools. And they would get together periodically and discuss various problems and issues. And one of the things that they were very concerned about was what kind of enrollments can we expect? Because we had this huge bulge right after World, after World War II, right. but then it was dropping and people didn't know, you know, what, what is going to happen. So uh, we worked on this using birth rates and high school information and so forth. And That must uh, have been a challenge. It really was. And it turned out we, we almost hit it on the nose several years, which is I mean, that's luck. <laughs> it, is. A lot. it is, but still it requires a lot of work. You don't yeah. want to go too far on one end or the other end. Yeah, it really was a good model, and it, it worked well. And I remember uh, when we presented it to the uh, commission, um, they were, you know, they said, oh, this is interesting, but they didn't uh, have too much to say about what to do. And President Hovde got up and said, Purdue University will produce this. We'll print it and we'll give everybody copies and we'll put them in all the libraries, which was really a, sure. a wonderful Was this for all the school, all the school, uh, the colleges? Yeah. Projection for all, by yep. the public and private? Yes, everybody. Wow. That was quite extensive. Yes. It was. It was, um, it was quite a job. Oh, and, I bet. And again, you know, today, with the computers you have today, it would, would be pretty easy, but we didn't have that, so. You we were still working to, with the unit record equipment. Yeah, but you still have to dig. You know, once you've got it in the computer, but you still have to dig to try to put it, oh, yes. get the data in there. Oh, yeah. and that's that's yeah. always yeah. going to take some yeah. kind of time. Yeah. We had to do that. Was, was there a limit on sizing? I mean, were, were there some, didn't make any difference whether it was a small school or a two-year, but you did it for all the schools yeah. in higher education? Yeah, we did, we did all of them. The public and the private? Yes. That's interesting. Yeah. And is that, are they still being done today? Well, the commission, the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, uh, actually contracted with us again in the um, 70s, late 70s, and we did some work for them at that point, and then they were going to take it over and do it, as far as I know. Right. That's what but in the interim, you were doing them almost every year? No, oh, no, just that no, we time. didn't do it every year. We did it for uh, a 20-year Projection. Projection. Okay. And, At one uh, time, this is what yeah. it's going to be. And in then we years. did it again in the late '60s and a 20-year projection. Okay. That one didn't go quite as well. <laughs> people, Times have changed. You people know. come and go. Yeah. Well, and the percentage of of students that go to college now is considerably higher. That's right. Than it was. Which at was that time. one of the things we were we were saying. This is going to happen. Right. And a lot of people did not believe did. it. Yeah. Oh. But you have the data to support that, yes. right? Yeah. What were some of the, in, in the Office of the Register, you maintain the academic records. Tell them about yes. what the office, what uh, you've taken it over, what uh, your main responsibilities and any and changes or uh, well, challenges. Well, always talk about it being the three R's that we record and we report and we register. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and the record, the academic record is really probably the, other than your position as a librarian, being uh, maintaining academic records is the most permanent thing the university has when you really get right down to it. You know, the, the grade reports come and go, and the faculty come and go, and everything, students come and go, but their record 
needs to be maintained basically forever. Right. And we do. We have the records all the way back to the leather-bound big books that they kept them in uh, when they first started. Mm -hmm. So we we have them all the way back, and that's that's quite a that challenge. Is. And right. of course, we went through a lot of different methods of maintaining that. Purdue was one of the first schools that had automated uh, records, and uh, I always say that's sort of a that's a blessing and a curse. You get something that really works, and then you can't get it changed. <laughs> so as as modern computers came in, it it was quite a uh, an effort to get them converted to to the new. Right. Uh, what was the impact on technology? Made a big impact. Oh, tremendous! Yeah. Tremendous. Before that, it was a lot of paper and pencil stuff. A lot of yes. And you had a lot of contact with the students too coming yes. in. Yes. Oh yes. And um, the yeah, the, I've always said that the accounting office and the and the registrar's office, both being record keepers, if you will, probably were the first people in the university to use computers right. and automated uh, techniques, and it really made a big difference. If we didn't have that, I mean, the to have thirty-eight thousand students, the Hubby Hall would be full of of clerks <laughs> keeping track of things, so it really has made a tremendous right. difference. And also the, registra uh, the registration process has changed over oh, yes. time, and that, yes. that is speeded up. It used up. to be in the armory. Oh, and, uh, I've seen pictures in the old yeah. debris, and they pull cards or whatever. Yes. They, you know. When I came as a student, it was in the armory, and uh, you walk in the door, and, and the advisor, if at least the person who told you what courses you should be signing up for, <laughs> was sitting at the end of the aisle and just hand you a little slip of paper and say, this is what you need to take. And then you'd go in there and look at this big board and Was it pick a up. board that would be hanging? It was, yes, it was oh. a huge board. And it had all the courses with the various sections. And then you had to find the one that would fit. You basically built your schedule. And then you had to go to these tables where they had clerks who would hand out a card. And if you got a card, you were in the class. If you got up there and they said, I, no, <laughs> there, are, there are no more cards, then you had to go back and find another section or hope you could fit something else in. The counseling was certainly different then. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, though. And, uh, it, was, it was quite a, quite a feat. And if you had been a... A good student, like if you were a distinguished student, you got to go first. You got to go ahead. Otherwise, they they did it. Sometimes they'd start with the beginning of the alphabet, and then they'd start with the middle, and then they'd start with the end. But if you had been a distinguished student, you could get in before <laughs> everybody. So you always were happy when that happened. <laughs> how how long many days did registration take? And he had a lot of little Oh, it didn't take long at all. Oh. It was mass registration. Okay. Everybody did it. It was like three or four days. Oh, okay. Yeah, he came ahead ahead of school. Right. Yeah. Did they have drop an ad at that time, too? Yes, they did. Okay. But it wasn't like it is today. Right. Either you had to make all your arrangements through the instructor. What about if you wanted to do any changing of the courses after you got in, you know, get in there? Now, well, that would be drop an ad, but if you got the yeah. cards and then you decided... Well, you may want to do something else. You'd have to go back to the area. Oh, yeah, you'd have to turn that card back in, yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I did change a course as a freshman because I was in, um, they, the, they put me in a physics class, and I had not had physics in high school, and I didn't know anything that they were talking about. I was just totally out in left field. <laughs> so I talked to the instructor, and he said, oh, yes, you should wait you know, and get some of this other material first. So I dropped the physics and picked up German. Okay. Uh, and so that was done through, and I, I think I went to an office to get that taken care of, but uh, it, was, it was pretty simple. Yeah, it oh, certainly is <clears throat> interesting. One of the things that you, people, you coordinate, that the office coordinates is commencement. Yes. That's a, has it always been just the two or... Uh, when did it, August didn't... Uh, oh, no, try, it, 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 yes, we it only to, had the, the ones in May. May. Uh, actually, when I was a student, they had commencements in January also. Hmm. Uh, but I think when the enrollment dropped back again, uh, you know, when the bulge of the GIs uh, redu was reduced, 
So they just did the did it in May. Okay. And we were ending up with uh, we had two in May, then we went to three, and then we went to four, and we still couldn't satisfy everybody. And the people who graduated in August and December uh, didn't want to come back in May, and the the regulation was you had to have graduated, so you couldn't do it ahead of time. So you can't walk like you can now if you're going to graduate. And, you know, uh, I don't. Maybe they're they doing that now. I maybe don't not, know. But, but but when I was there, you could not do that. Right. You had to have already completed your your degree. Mm -hmm. uh, the theory was, you know, you shouldn't walk across the stage unless you're really graduating. Sure. Now we didn't didn't take people out if their name was in the program if at the last minute they didn't graduate. <laughs> but. Uh, if you weren't going to graduate until the following December, you, you couldn't participate in commencement. Right. It made it would probably make it hard if, if you've got a job or something of that sort yeah. To, yeah. To, to try to come yeah. back. So it really was a nice uh, thing to add it. And we, we started with just a little reception in December. And it was when um, John Hicks was the acting, uh, the interim president. Sure. And he was very interested in in doing that kind of thing, so we had it. We had it over in the union, the ballroom for the for December for people. the December people, and then it just sort of grew from that. And then it turned out we were having enough people graduating in August that that was a time we could do a commencement also. Right. So. What about do you coordinate the commencements at the regional campuses too, or do they handle? That? Uh, they handled the commencement pretty much, but we coordinated. I coordinated the. Um, getting the president and the, the uh, trustees and getting all their gowns and everything up there and making sure that everything was set up for them. Okay, because they go and they, they go to those. They were, the, they were, yes, President Bering went to commencements all over. He even went to a lot of the statewide technology commencements at some of the other campuses, the IU campuses. Right. The, the statewide, oh, that's, in, they mm -hmm. have a different, they have different spots for that, too. Yeah, yeah. statewide technology was introduced and they uh, were going through some of the other campuses, mostly IU extension centers, but they, uh, they did also have some with some other private schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don Gentry and uh, President Berry went to all those commencements, that's, which was really quite right. nice. That's, and it's nice because they still get the diploma. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah. And it, it's, yeah. A personal it's a touch. Purdue degree. Yeah, mm -hmm. right, and it's a personal touch for the commencement yes. thing. It's yes. really kind of nice. Um, with the organizational reporting structure for the registrar, that's changed over time, has it not? I mean, registrar reports to the Vice Center. President for Student Services. Has it always been that way? Well, no, because oh. it uh, it's always been that way since I was involved sure. with the office. Oh. But uh, earlier, there uh, there wasn't a Vice President for Student Services. You know, there was a, a basically an academic Vice President, and in the registrar. Actually, there was uh, when I first did the enrollment projection studies. Um, Clarence Damon was the director of admissions and registrar, and Mr. Parkhurst was the associate registrar, and Harland White was the associate director of admissions. So it was a combined office. And then they, when uh, Mr. Damon died, they split the two offices out. Registrars and admissions. Yes. Okay. And, but they went. They reported to the academic vice president. Okay. But now it's uh, now they report up through uh, vice, vice president for student, student services okay. who reports to the okay. provost. One of the things uh, now you have the semester's honors list and more recognition for the students, isn't that? Yes. The, the academic standards that were changed about in '91. Before that, they didn't they didn't have that, or what were some of the changes that came about? Well, they always had uh, honor areas. Um, even when I came in as a student, they had uh, distinguished students, sure. and, okay. and then you graduated with distinction or highest distinction. But we have a lot more honors now, and they have an honors uh, convocation, right? Right. Um, and they have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter, which we didn't have. Sure. And does does the enrollment or the lineup always been in the armory for the for commencement? It's always been a healthy. Yeah, home. pretty much. Okay. Yeah, and. Uh, Yes, it has been. And but before that, when they started those receptions in December, they probably just had it. Did they have a, the ceremony or something in the Union? Yes. Oh, yeah, they, they did the whole thing they in the, the whole Union. Thing in uh -huh. the Union. They wore their caps and gowns, too? 
Um, I don't think they did okay. because I, they, in general, the bookstores uh, get those in and you sure. rent them. And I, I believe when we just had the reception, they just, they just wore more regular guns. clothes. Right. Yeah. Okay. And we talked about technology, Tim, and then your reports. Uh, what is the the and the is there any liaison with the regional campuses and the registrar? Or there yes. Some, okay. Yes, very much so. We okay. we work very uh, closely with them because first of all, the course numbering system is the same, and uh, there was a um, we were trying very much to keep the courses compatible, so that if they transferred to one of the other campuses, their courses. Would transfer. Would, with, would transfer, right. and if it was a prerequisite, you had the material you needed to do the next course. Sure. So we were very closely associated with them. The course, what we call the course master, which is basically a course catalog, uh, was supposed to be the same. They didn't offer everything, but. Uh, Did they, they issue separate catalogs, or would they be using ours? Uh, they probably issued a separate catalog. Okay, but the but course numbers supposed be to be the course numbers would be the same, and the course content was supposed to be the same. But you know, even between two professors, it might not be exactly the same. Right. But at least you're covering this. Yeah, the basically same the same material. And we also maintained the permanent academic record for uh, all the other campuses as well. So they send them down here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And now I can send it by computer. I would. Yeah, imagine. it was sent it by computer, yeah. and we issued the grade reports. Okay. Uh, so that they, what they got as a grade report was what was officially put on the academic record. So that if if those didn't match up, you know, the the student knew to to right. check it out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, what tell us about your interaction with the students? How much interaction you had? Quite a bit over time. Yes, I had a lot when I was uh, over in the School of Humanities uh, because I was an academic advisor for sure. about 150 each year. And um, then I did some teaching. Uh, I taught some statistics through the Department of Education. <clears throat> and as a registrar, you had almost daily contact with someone who had a problem of some sort. Uh, those were usually the ones that I got to see. <laughs> the interesting but, ones. Yeah, right. The challenges. Yeah, That's the part the of the challenge. Who, the one who thought that he was in one section of a course and the, the instructor thought he was in another section and I got... A little sticky crossway. wickets. Yeah, yeah right, right. Trying right. to work it out. You served up for a couple of presidents, uh, President Hansen and President Faring, didn't you? Uh, yes. And, and he, President Hovde. And President Hovde, right. Mm -hmm. Each has their own uh, different style. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Very different. Yeah. And they were all they were all great, but yeah. very different. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Baring was the most recent one that she did yes. with Dr. Hansen. Um, you uh, tell us you've done some consulting work. The American Association of Collegiate Registrars. Tell us yes. a little bit about some of the consulting things that you've done. Okay. Uh, when I was uh, again Mr. Parkhurst uh, at one point in time was the president of that organization. That's the National Association for Registrars and Admissions Officers. Uh -huh. And uh, he had, was proposing that they do a, a migration study, uh, migration of students from state to state, because the uh, federal government was doing reports along those lines, and it took them forever to get the reports out and they weren't complete, and he was convinced that the association could do a better job by getting the registrars and admissions people to get, get the information to them, and they, would, put it they would massage this for them. So they took him up on that. <laughs> so, sure, why, why wouldn't So uh, he asked me to, to do the report, and we did, and we got it out uh, in a very timely fashion, and uh, in fact, at my retirement, he reminded me that he was we were able to do something that the federal government couldn't do. <laughs> we put our, our <laughs> nose to the grindstone, right? Yes. Or yes. Words to that so, so we did. Do they uh, do they still do uh, no, similar ones? They, no. They, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure anybody does it anymore. I haven't seen a report for a long time. <laughs> oh. You were also you were a research consultant for the Sears Roebuck Scholarship Foundation. Yes. What did that entail? Okay, that was uh, through the uh, School of Agriculture. 
Uh, Dean Freeman was uh, very active in the Sears Roebuck Scholarship Foundation. They were giving scholarships to uh, agriculture students, and they'd been doing it for a number of years. Uh, they were what we would consider small scholarships now, but they were very significant at, to, that, uh, at yeah, that time. Sure. And they, he wanted to know, uh, the, well, the foundation wanted to know, and he asked me if, if I would uh, do a survey or something and find out what had happened to some of these Sears scholars. So we developed a questionnaire and sent it out, and it was just a remarkable response and how grateful they were and how much difference it made in their life. Uh, several of them would say things like, you know, nobody thought I should go to college, you know, I should just come back to the farm. And, and uh, but when, this, when I won the Sears Roebuck scholarship, my parents said, well, I guess if Sears thinks you're worth it, you know, you should go to school. And then and his whole life had changed as a result of that. They were, they were all so appreciative of these scholarships. Did, uh, was it just for, limited only to Indiana or um, uh, for the uh, Sears Foundation? The, the people I was surveying were limited only to Purdue, but the Sears scholarships were Funded other, other schools as well? Yeah. Right. Did they, was it for a year on a year by year basis? It or? was a year by year basis. If you so, kept your GPA up, or yes, or if you had to and, up and I think it was reduced. I mean, the, there were more freshman scholarships, and then uh, sophomores, not not everybody got one. Uh, right. Okay. But it, and it, they weren't. You know, they were like a hundred, two hundred dollars. But in putting but it in it, perspective, what the tuition was at that that's point right. was very good. That's right. When I came, the tuition was fifty-five dollars a semester. I've heard those so. numbers. <laughs> I know. Even before that, there was nothing. It was just the fees. You know. Yeah. But you know, that was hard for your parents that's to come right. up with even that kind that's of money right. in exactly. those days. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And then you also were for the Indiana Conference of Higher Education. You did the were a research consultant there. That was the, the, uh, uh, the, was that the was the enrollment one? projections. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Tell us a little about some of your awards that you've gotten. Uh, you've got an Iron Key Honorary. Yes, And yes. Uh, the Alpha Lambda Delta, the National Honor, the Scholastic Honor. Yes. Uh, yeah. How did those come about? Did, were you surprised? Yes, I was. Good. And I was a, an honorary, I'm an honorary mortar board, too. That's um, right. And yes, I was absolutely astounded. I was in Alpha Lambda Delta as a student um, but then I had done some, some work for them uh, to get some information that they needed to, to do some sure. Right. And uh, for some reason, they That's very, they, they that's gave very me nice. Honorary. And then also, you got uh, Kappa Delta Pi is another one, too, yes. that you got an award yes. from. That was through the Department of Education. Yeah, yeah. very nice. Yeah. And you, uh, tell, in, in uh, your association memberships, have you held any offices in some of the associations, the professional associations? Yes, I was a vice president for research and publications for the American Association of Collegiate Registrars right. and Admissions What did that in, entail? Uh, well, we were... Tell us about the association okay, for the researchers. Okay, that's, that's the national association, and um, they, they have... Uh, a board, um, and they they meet periodically throughout the year. It's a three-year appointment, or a, yeah, election. I guess we did get elected. I <laughs> get nominated. <laughs> Understand. But at any rate, uh, you attend some of the. We split up the uh, regional and state associations, and you go to those meetings and give a keynote address and. And actually, I worked on getting the journal uh, upgraded for the uh, association. It comes out quarterly. And uh, it was not really uh, um, juried before. And I felt like it really needed to, to have that. Sure. So we now have an editorial board, and, and they review that. And some of these research things that we were talking about, I worked right. on that. Right, came into that, right. Yeah. And I was active on various committees with that group, but also with our state. The state has an association. Sure. And I've been the uh, president of that uh, and was given a Distinguished Service Award Very honor nice. for that. And I have permanent lifetime membership in the National Association 
That's so right. I get the journals still and information. That's from, very nice. Yes. Nice to have that life. Yes, it is. Well, talk, uh, tell us about family. Do you have, you have children? Do any of your I children do. go to school here? I have two children. My daughter went to Ball State and is an architect. Um, and she has three children. One of them is 17, and I'm hoping, hoping that he'll come to Purdue. <laughs> is he thinking about it? He is. Or is the, are the family thinking about it, or both? Well, I'm not sure the family is thinking about it, but he and I are thinking about it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> He's interested in technical graphics, and I, you know, we have a, have good, a, very good, we have a good program sure. here for that. And it would be very nice. He loves Purdue. And uh, so she has three children, and he's the oldest, okay. and two girls. And my son uh, went to the Air Force Academy. So he just retired from the Air Force last year. Okay. And he's living in Albuquerque, and he has two children. Okay. They're 14 and 8. So. Okay. He was in, was he in for 20 years or something? 24. With 24? Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. So they traveled around. Was he was great. everywhere, <sighs> yeah. And wherever he went, I'd always go visit. He went to France, and I went to France. He went to Brazil. I went to Brazil. <laughs> you follow him along, right? Drop right. in and see. Mother can right. drop in. Yeah, all right. he's, he's been all over the place. Yeah. Oh. Now, your retirement activities. You, um, I guess after you retired, you still stayed on a little bit, uh, didn't you? Yes, I of, did. And what uh, sort of, tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> they uh, were establishing... Um, Working on getting the new computer systems going, which, as as you know, they're still working on. But uh, they wanted departmental computing managers to work with them, and I was the I did that for two years for student services. Sure. And they had one for the uh, human resources and one for alumni association and you know the various uh, entities around the campus. And we get together and talk about how to. How to make this work, um, and it was it was it was yeah, a good thing to do. Benefited by your experience and uh, you know expertise yes. along that line, yes. so it was worked out well for, yes. from their standpoint as well as the universities. And then you've been the ro uh, Rotary. You're pretty involved in. A. You were the president yes, of 0304. I've been the president of the Lafayette Rotary Club. All right. And uh, right now I'm the president of the Purdue Retirees Association. Right. Does that has that grown over time? Oh yes, yeah. yes it has. It started. It's, how did it well, it was, it's interesting. Harlan White, basically, Harlan White and President Hansen had a conversation about how uh, retiree, he's, the, the, the university should capture some of the expertise of retirees and find out all the various things that they might have to offer. And so President Hansen set up a, a what was called the Purdue uh, Retirees Advisory Committee to the president basically. And that's what it was called for quite a long while. And that's pretty much what it was. But over the years, things evolved and they began to plan little trips for people and, and uh, get Different together committee. for lunch and have speakers and uh, become involved more with each other. And, 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 and revolving around the university as right, well. Right, right. And now it, it is really blossoming, I think. We've, we've had wonderful liaison with the university. We work through the Human Resources Department. They, they give us a lot of help and support administratively. Sure. And uh, Murray Blackwelder is our advisor, and he has just been extremely helpful. He comes to our board meetings and... and uh, Good. We we were. And you got for, your newsletter for another. We've got thing, a newsletter which is out, nice. which is and that originally was just a little mimeoed sheet, and and now we have a really. It's um, really nice because nice yeah, we get and, one for the archives. And that's yeah, nice. that's great. Yeah. And in fact, we are you are archiving our history. That's uh, right. John right. Stover wrote a history several years ago, and then it's been updated, and we're maintaining the records which. Is very helpful because it was really difficult to pull all that out. Yeah, right. And we used to mimeo the directory of, of retirees, and now they include us in the phone book. Which is very Which nice. is wonderful. Which is really and nice. I know everybody has been very appreciative of that. They really are, particularly because somebody asked me the other day, said, oh, so-and-so might be somebody you want to talk with. And I said, I don't think the person lives here anymore. It's true. Uh, it's listed in the the address is, is given there, and it's sort of nice, like yes. Christmas cards or things of that sort. Yeah. And you don't realize, and uh, the person has moved out of town. 
Yeah. So it, it's a it's a nice addition to yes, the, to it the really uh, directory. Is. <laughs> it's, it's really been very helpful. Yeah. Have you been active in the alumni at all since uh, being a Purdue grad, an alumni association, or? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, I was years ago, but I haven't been. For... But over time, there's still some activities and things that you can, yeah. you know, participate yeah. in. Right. Um, how about a favorite memory of Purdue? You got something or an outstanding event or both? Uh, oh boy. I guess it's it's not just an event, but as as I look back at being here between 1947 and 51 was really an exciting time to be at Purdue, I think. Uh, Elaborate a little bit on that. Just right? because of the, you know, the, the, I think that the GIs really changed higher education. They really made it a more motivated, uh, you know, they weren't just playing around and <laughs> it was serious business. There was more focus. More focus. And so that, I think we got a really good education as a result of that. Uh, it just, it just sparked right. everybody. It, it invigorated the faculty. I mean, here they had some people who really, really wanted to learn. Right. You know? <laughs> Energized. Energized, right. right. And uh, so that was, that was a good thing. Yeah. And we did uh, beat Notre Dame at football. Now there's an event, and I was at that game <laughs> when we uh, broke their big winning their long streak. Record. Don't stick in your mind, you do not forget. As a, as a matter of fact, I was sitting on the uh, Notre Dame side because a friend Was of it my, here or up there? It was in Notre Dame. Oh, up South Bend. At South Bend, Okay. and uh, a friend of mine, uh, her uncle was uh, a Studebaker dealer in South Bend. And he got these tickets for us. So we were sitting within all the Notre Dame fans. <laughs> <laughs> they just could not believe it. Right. They were so upset. Oh, yeah. Those, yeah. There's a lot of rivalry there. And of course, we were just screaming our heads off, and we, we were lucky to get out <laughs> alive. <laughs> 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 it's like in the stands today when the, when there's some seats and the team that we're playing is sitting, you know, close by and they're getting rampant. I yes. understand having yes. been this that yes. for a long time. Um, any closing comments or some questions or something that you'd like to share with the researchers about the registrar or anything in general? Because the researchers will be studying this. It'll help us okay. with the history of the university. Uh, well, I think that uh, a lot of people probably believe that of the registrar's office is just sort of a super clerk sort of thing. And I think, I believe it really is uh, our history and we, we must maintain those records. Um, as you know, being a librarian, how important that that's is. Right. If you lose it, it's gone. Right. And, and really, that's the only place it's going to be it shows the trail. And that's very important. It tracks the entire university. You can find coursework, you can find faculty, you can find all kinds of information as a result of that. And if that's not there, there's uh, big gaps. You have really lost your history. That's right. Yes. And I, I think that everybody that that was working with me understood that, right. and we worked very, very hard to make sure everything was accurate, and uh, that we could verify that this person really did graduate, this person really did do all these things and so forth. Right. Do you right. think that the uh, technology has, has aided in that fashion, do you think? Yes, the I think it has. The record keeping is, is, is accurate, and but the maintenance is a little bit easier. Uh, yes, it's also easier to... <laughs> to retrieve it. <laughs> yes. Right. If you've got it's something. also easier to... to uh, Mess it up, so to speak. It goes both ways, right? <laughs> yeah. So you do have to have a lot of backup, and uh, you get pretty, uh, pretty cautious about a lot of things, which, which is good because sure. once it's gone, it's gone. That's right, exactly. And uh, so we, you know, we had a lot of backup, and still do. Um, what do you, What about the condition of the earlier records? They're still in paper. Are you have you yes. giving them to the arch? Are you still keeping them? Yes. Or they're stored in a spot. They're stored, and we microfilmed them. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, we've got more than one copy, and 
Even the earlier records, you got microfilm to as well? Uh, the ones that are in the big leather bound books, probably not. Okay. But we still got them. Yeah. And in fact, when I retired, I found a, a leather bound book that was really faculty minutes about, and we brought it over to your oh, archives. You? Okay. Uh, because it was, uh, it was very valuable. It, it showed the students that got demerits. You know, for example, John T. McCutcheon had a demerit. <laughs> for going across town when he wasn't supposed to and that kind of thing. But it was really, uh, it was It's a really, storehouse of knowledge and yeah, it's nice to yeah, have. Yeah, right. and we felt like that was something that really needed to be in the in your archives. Sure, right, oh. good, okay. Any closing comments, that, anything else that you can think of that you'd I, like to share? I don't, okay. uh, I, I appreciate this opportunity right. because- We uh, thank you very much, Betty. Purdue, I've been at Purdue for 60 years, so. This is great. <laughs> it's and, and still counting, right? And still counting, right. right? Okay, this concludes the interview, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank Thanks. you. Uh,